Hotep, everybody. This is Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, March 17th, 2024, and we are live. Welcome to the African History Network show. We have a very exciting show for you today. Well, as many of you all know and have been looking at uh, posts I've been doing on Facebook uh, today, you know that today is St. Patrick's Day. March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, and it commemorates uh, when St. Patrick uh, passed away, March 17th, uh, 1461 AD, it's believed. And you know the question uh, comes up each year, and I usually do a broadcast dealing with this, um, should African Americans celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Should African Americans celebrate St. Patrick's Day? So we're going to uh, discuss that on today's show. We have a lot of information uh, for you, all right? So on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. Uh, share this broadcast here on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. So we're going to discuss uh, should African Americans celebrate St. Patrick's Day uh, do you know what you're celebrating? Do you know what you're celebrating and why? You know, when we were in school, elementary school, for instance, we were told to wear green on St. Patrick's Day. We were told to celebrate St. Patrick's Day uh, in school, but we were never really told why. Okay, now um, we see that uh, around this time of the year, you're going to see St. Patrick's Day parades. Uh, you're going to see uh, Kiss, Kiss Me, I'm Irish t-shirts and greened beer. It's estimated, uh, it's, it's expected that 162 million Americans, 162 million Americans will spend approximately $7.2 billion on St. Patrick related items, St. Patrick Day related items. And this is information that comes from the uh, National Retail uh, Federation, NRF.com. One of the strangest things that you will see is African Americans participating in this celebration. Uh, now, do you really know what you are celebrating? And I remember uh, about 12 years ago, I was working at a call center and uh, I went to work uh, on St. Patrick's Day, didn't really pay attention that it was St. Patrick's Day. I get to work. I see people wearing green, including um, African-American employees that are wearing green. So then it clicked, okay, this is for St. Patrick's Day. So then I just decided to uh, start asking people questions. And the, the African-Americans uh, employees, I uh, started asking them questions. Well, why are you wearing green? And they said it was St. Patrick's Day and they had to represent for St. Patrick, things like that. So then I asked the question, well, who was St. Patrick and what is St. Patrick known for? Um, and most people couldn't answer the question. They would say, oh, he's a saint. Somebody said he drove the snakes out of Ireland. Somebody said he brought Christianity to the Irish. Well, we're going to dig into this history and dispel a lot of this nonsense, a lot of these myths. OK, and I ask people, have you studied the history of St. Patrick's Day? And even if you claim that you have Irish ancestry, even if you claim that you have Irish ancestry, which some of us do, um, like Tina Turner said, what's love got to do with it? What, what does that have to do with anything if you have Irish ancestry? And I always ask the question. And I posted this on our Facebook page. Um, if you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? If not, why not? If you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? Okay, if not, why not? So the, the very same people who say, well, I'm wearing uh, green on St. Patrick's Day, because uh, I'm 7% Irish or 10% Irish. Well, I have to ask them the question, uh, do you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? 
And if we look here at the, I want to look here at one of the posts that I did uh, dealing with this here. Let's go to our Facebook fan page of the African History Network. Let's flip over to this. All right. Let's see. Let's flip over to this right here. Okay, so I did this post uh, today, and it says... Yeah, if you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear wear will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation, which is May 25th? And it commemorates May 25th, 1963, when the organization of African uh, Unity was was organized. And you see, it's got five uh, likes or uh, or hearts. It's gotten uh, a number of comments. Okay, how many comments has gotten? About 47 comments. But I did another post also uh okay this one right here what uh why do african americans celebrate saint patrick's day saint patrick wasn't irish what are you celebrating find out sunday 8 p.m eastern standard time okay find out sunday 8 p.m eastern standard time uh that one got 295 likes uh and then there was one that i did earlier in the week and let's see if we could find that one because it got almost a thousand uh it got almost a thousand likes also i did it maybe two ago but I'm always interested to see the responses from people. And questions like this are really designed to make people think and cause people to ask the question, why are you participating in these European holidays we've been taught to celebrate? Okay. Why are you participating in these European holidays we've been taught to celebrate? Because once again, a lot of the stuff we were taught to do when we were children and may have never questioned it. Uh, and the people who we asked the question to may not have had the answers. Okay. And then we just go through life perpetuating uh, this, you know, uh, some people may refer to it as dedicated ignorance. Uh, that's probably what one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagans, would call it, ded dedicated ignorance. Okay. Now, here's the post that I did earlier in the week this was probably on the 14th march uh, uh march 14th and this one got 979 uh likes or hearts and 209 comments okay you wear green on saint patrick's day will you wear red black and green on african liberation day follow us on our facebook fan page the african history network the african history network also my youtube channel michael m hotep i m h o t e p we have a one million followers on our, our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Okay, so um, and today, like I said today, you know, I saw people posting about celebrating St. Patrick's Day, going to St. Patrick's Day parties, uh, maybe either Saturday night or today, drinking green beer, etc. Okay, uh, now I want to make this very clear: I'm not telling people that they shouldn't, especially African-Americans. I'm not telling African-Americans um, that they should not celebrate St. Patrick's Day, okay? What I am saying is that we should at least understand the history behind what it is that we've been taught to celebrate. We should at least understand the history behind what it is we've been taught to celebrate. And that goes for any of these holidays, especially these European holidays, okay? Somebody asked for the date of African Liberation Day. It's May 25th. Um, two books that I recommend are by Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango. Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango, African People and European Holidays, A Mental Genocide, Book One and Book Two. And in these books, he goes through history and look, looks at history chronologically. And he goes through and analyzes, gives you, deals with the history of these different European holidays uh, we've been taught to celebrate, okay? So check these out at your local African-American uh, book dealer, bookstore. If you can't find it there, then maybe on uh, Amazon. All right, now, uh, let's get into this discussion. You can post your comments here. 
when I want to look and see uh, how much money a holiday is going to generate, I always go to NRF.com, uh, which is the National uh, Retail Federation, NRF.com. National Retail Federation. When you hear in the news media that a particular holiday, Christmas or Easter or something, is going to generate X amount, X amount of billions of dollars or Halloween, they're getting this from the National Retail Federation. So if we look quickly here, uh, National Retail Federation has, has been conducting its annual St. Patrick's Day survey for more than a decade to see how consumers to see how consumers plan to spend for to spend for and celebrate during the popular cultural holiday more consumers than ever are celebrating saint patrick's day in 2024 um it's estimated that 62 percent of americans plan to celebrate and they expect to spend on average 44 dollars 40 cents each it, so it's um you're looking at 162 Americans are expected to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Okay, so that that is a record. All right, now so you can check out the rest of this here. They have uh, some charts. They see, they have uh, some graphs here, some charts that you can uh, take a look at look at as well. All right, now for some historical information, historical background on St. Patrick's Day. And usually when I do this broadcast, because um, I've done a few over the past 10 years, then when I say Patrick's Day, usually the broadcast is about two hours. I really don't want to do two hours today. Uh, it's been very busy. And I spoke at St. Francis Missionary Baptist Church Saturday morning. I was there like 9.30 uh, a.m. Uh, Saturday morning. So <laughs> I want to try to keep this to an hour. Hopefully we'll see. I'm not known to be brief in speaking, especially when it comes to history. But a good article dealing with this topic is from History.com. History.com is the official website of the History Channel. And I've read hundreds of articles at History.com. I use some of the resources in my online history classes. We'll also give you some information about the online history classes that I teach on uh, on, on Saturdays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And we deal with thousands of thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for this online history course. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. We have the class lesson plans for all uh, 10 plus classes, 10 plus class sessions here already laid out. You can download the plan. You can see the type of information that we're dealing with uh, in this course. OK. All right. So we'll give you some more information about that. But when we look at this article dealing with um, who was St. Patrick, OK, who was St. Patrick from History.com? And yeah, let me go back to it here. Uh, St. Patrick is known as the patron saint of Ireland, Ireland, but he was not Irish. And uh, he found his faith while being hailed as a prisoner by a group of Irish raiders. OK, so one of the first things that you find out in history is Patrick was not born in Ireland. OK, he was most likely born in Britain. Some sources will say Scotland or pop possibly Wales. Now, St. Patrick is patron saint of Ireland, and he is one of Christianity's most widely known figures, one of Christianity's most widely known figures. But for all of his prevalence in culture, namely the holiday held on the day of his death, March 17th, uh, 461 AD, common era is believed. Some sources will say 460 AD he died. Namely the holiday held on the day of his death, that bears his name, his life remains somewhat of a mystery. His life remains somewhat of a mystery. Many of the stories traditionally associated with St. Patrick, including the famous of banishing all of the snakes from Ireland, are false. F-A-L-S-E, false. Many of the accounts, many of the famous accounts of him banishing all the snakes from Ireland 
and traditional folklore we hear surrounding uh, Patrick, many of these are false. They are the products of hundreds of years of exaggerated storytelling, okay? Hundreds of years of exaggerated storytelling. So when we look at uh, one of the first myth busters, okay, dealing with Patrick, is uh, Patrick was not Irish. So, you know, I pose that question to people, especially African-Americans who want to claim their Irish ancestry. And if you say you're 10% Irish, therefore you should celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Then if you 70%, 75%, 80% African, does that mean that you are going to celebrate uh, African Liberation Day? That's a, that's a good slogan for it there, okay? Uh, <laughs> if you're 10% Irish and celebrate St. Patrick's Day and you're 70% African, don't you think you should celebrate African Liberation Day? Now, St. Patrick was born in Great Britain, not Ireland, to wealthy parents near the end of the 4th century Common Era, A.D. He is believed to have died on March 17th Around 460 A.D., some sources say 461 A.D., although his father was a Christian deacon, it has suggested that he probably took on the role because of tax incentives, and there is no evidence that uh, Patrick came from a particularly religious family. There's no evidence that Patrick came from a particularly religious family. At the age, at the age of 16, Patrick was taken prisoner by a group of Irish raiders who were attacking his family's estate. They transported him to Ireland where he spent six years in captivity. So when you study this history, you I've watched videos from history.com. I've looked at numerous sources on this. I actually have a file folder on St. Patrick's Day and uh dealing with uh, St. Patrick's Day articles. So I've looked at a lot of information on this. Uh, articles here, articles here that I'm going to discuss today, other more articles right here. And about 10 years ago, when I was researching history on St. Patrick, on, on St. Patrick's Day, I bought this book here. And I read this one to get a better understanding of this whole history surrounding uh, St. Patrick's Day in Irish history. The Everything Irish History and Heritage book by Amy Hackney Blackwell and Ryan Hackney. Okay, so to get a better understanding of just Irish history, um, the chronology of this history, things like this, and um, the significance to of uh, St. Patrick to the Irish and Irish Americans, etc. I read this book. All right, I got this back in, um, I think it's probably about 10 years ago uh, when I got this book. That's one of the few books I didn't write the date in when I got it. Okay, so there is some dispute over where this captivity took place, although many believe he was taken um, to live in Mount Slemish in, 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 in County Antrim, A-N-T-R-I-M, it is more likely that he was held in County Mayo near Kalala, K-I-L-L-A-L-A. -L -L -A -L -A. But nuts, he was taken captive by uh, a, a group of um, Irish raiders, and he was taken into Ireland, where he was an Irish slave. Now, well, he was a After the dead of winter, St. Patrick's Day is a welcome sign of spring. He was a slave in Ireland. Now, lonely and afraid, he turned to his religion for solace, becoming a devout Christian, becoming a devout Christian. It is also believed that Patrick first began to dream of converting the Irish people to Christianity during his captivity. OK, now we know um, we hear the story of Pope Celestine the first. Uh, sending Patrick into Ireland 431 AD to uh, convert the uh, Irish to Christianity, okay? About 432 AD, 
432 AD, but the year before you have uh, a Irishman who sent in in uh, 431 AD uh, by the name of uh, Palladius to convert them to Christianity also. Patrick gets the credit for this. There was a small amount of Christians uh, in Ireland when Patrick goes in in 432 AD. Now, after more than six years as a prisoner, Patrick escaped. According to his, uh, according to his writing, a voice which he believed to be God, a voice which he believed to be God's voice, spoke to him in a dream, telling him it was time to leave Ireland. Now, to leave Ireland, Patrick walked from County Mayo, where it is believed it is believed he was held. Uh, he walked from there to the Irish coast. After escaping to Britain, Patrick reported that he experienced a second revelation. He said an angel in a dream tells him to return to Ireland as a missionary. An angel in a dream tells him to return to Ireland as a missionary. Now, soon after this, Patrick began a uh, religious training, a course of study that lasted more than 15 years. After his ordination as a priest, Patrick was sent to Ireland with a dual mission. One, to minister to Christians already living in Ireland and to begin and to convert the Irish. Now, interestingly enough, this mission uh, contradicts the notion that Patrick introduced Christianity to Ireland because, as I said, Pope Simon I, the previous year in 431 AD, um, actually sent a bishop in uh, to convert the Irish to Christianity. So there was already a small number of uh, Christians already there, okay? And actually, it's, uh, I'll get that name. I have that name. I think it's Palladius. It's in one of my uh, notes here on this. Uh, where is that? So I've got a bunch of notes on this. I think it was Palladius. Okay, but we'll get to that. Where is that here? All right, let's continue. Okay, so if we look here at, uh, let's see, we're going to pick up. Okay, St. Patrick incorporated Irish culture into Christian lessons, okay? St. Patrick incorporated Irish culture into Christian lessons. Now, familiar with the Irish language and culture, Patrick chose to incorporate traditional rituals into uh, his lessons of Christianity instead of attempting to eat native Irish beliefs. Now, this is important to understand because we see the same thing when the, when the Roman Empire adopts Christianity and then they start to incorporate um, what would be called pagan traditions into their celebration that's going to be called Christmas. OK, that would later be called Christmas. We're going to uh, see this, the Festival of Saturnalia and, uh, you know, the Festival of Juvenalia, different things like this. But as the Roman Empire is spreading and they're conquering people, elements uh, that people are already celebrating get incorporated into Roman traditions. And we're going to see this with um, Easter and we're going to see this with Christmas also. OK, now. I may say some things that go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Uh, probably should have started with my disclaimer. And I learned this from uh, one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens of the African Village. Uh, I may say some things that go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard them before or disagree with them does not mean that they're not true. It just means you have to do some research to better understand what I'm saying, okay? So I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle. 
I usually say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. So just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. So we're going to get into some of that information today. All right. So familiar with the familiar with the Irish language and culture, Patrick chose to incorporate traditional rituals into his lessons of Christianity instead of attempting instead of attempting to erode Irish beliefs. This also makes it easier to convert people that you're trying to conquer because they still see elements that are familiar to them in the new doctrine that's being imposed upon them. So this is a methodology uh, that's utilized uh, in conquering people to reduce resistance also. Now, for instance, Patrick used bonfires to celebrate Easter since the Irish were used to honoring their gods with fire. Okay, he used bonfires to celebrate Easter since the Irish were used to uh, used to honoring their gods with or deities with fire. Okay, we're going to talk about Easter, Easter, oyster in just a second here, just a minute. Now, Patrick also superimposed a sun, S U N, which is a powerful Irish symbol. He superimposed the sun onto the Christian cross to create what is now called a Celtic cross. So that veneration of the symbol would seem more natural to the Irish. So when you study history and you study people being conquered, this is a typical methodology used to conquer people and reduce their resistance and reduce their, their desire to resist. Although there were a small number of Christians on the island, when Patrick arrived, most Irish practiced a nature-based what they call quote unquote pagan religion. Now we have to deal with that word pagan and deal with it etymologically to understand it because pagan is oftentimes used, especially in, in uh, European anthropology and archaeology, etc. The term pagan is oftentimes used as a negative term. But as I'm going to show you here in just a minute, when we look at uh, the actual definition of the word pagan, uh, pagan is not something negative in its truest sense of the word. Okay. It's just like the term primary and they, some, sometimes, um, uh, Europeans will refer to African people and say African people are prime or, or, or primitive people. Well, primitive means first African people are the first people. We went all around the world. We circumnavigated the globe. I'm glad you recognize this. I'm glad you're telling the truth. We, are, we primitive means primary. Okay. So sometimes they use it in a negative term, but they don't may not actually understand what they are admitting. All right, let's continue here and give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a, a like on this broadcast. Be sure to follow us on our social media platforms on YouTube, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Facebook, the African History Network, and uh, the AHN show on Instagram. All right, let's continue. So although there were a small number of Christians on the island when Patrick arrived, most Irish practice based, quote unquote, pagan religion. The Irish culture centered around a rich tradition of oral legend and myth a rich tradition of oral legend and myth. When this is considered, it is no surprise that the story of Patrick's life became exaggerated over the centuries. Okay. And we see a lot of exaggerating when it comes to uh, the life of Patrick. Became exaggerated over the centuries, spinning exciting tales to remember history has always been a part of the Irish way of life. Now, one of the other things that you learn when you study Patrick 
is that he was never, never canonized as a saint. He was never canonized as a saint. OK, um, he may be known as the patron saint of Ireland, but Patrick was never canon was never actually canonized by the Catholic Church. This is simply due to the era in uh, that he lived in. OK, E.R.A. Era, not era as in a mistake, E.R.R.O.R., -R -R, but era as in period of time, E.R.A. This is simply due to the era that he lived in. Now, during the first millennium. There was no formal canonization process in the Catholic Church. After becoming a priest and helping to spread Christianity throughout Ireland, Patrick was likely proclaimed uh, a saint by popular acclaim. Likely proclaimed a saint by popular acclaim. Okay, now, I want to, we, we talked about this term pagan and then a lot of times when you deal with ancient religion or religions prior to christianity or those that may, may be in competition with christianity the term pagan is used uh as a pejorative or derisively it's used in a negative way okay so uh, i want to look at this very quickly here all right and uh, also, I want to let you know, I forgot, I should have said this at the beginning of the show when we um, did our opening for the African History Network show. We are celebrating uh, our 14th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show, which first started March 10th, 2010. OK, I look like a little kid then. OK, people still I'm 52. People still call me a youngster. OK, Dr. Leonard Jeffries calls me a youngster. Uh, but. <laughs> And I've lost I've lost weight since uh, I went and looked at the broadcast I did. Um, I was looking at a broadcast I did in 2022. OK, and I can look and see I've lost weight. I've lost about 35 pounds since January 2022. But um, we're celebrating our our uh, 13th year anniversary. Let me broadcast the African History Network show and you can support us. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, uh, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills. And then uh, also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, we have the uh, information right on the home page. Uh, of the screen. So when you scroll down past the information dealing with our class, um, class information, we have uh, the information here. This is our official cash app account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S H O W. When you go to it, it'll, it'll say Michael. These other ones here are fake African History Network cash app accounts. They've been stealing money from us. I'm still trying to get them shut down. I put our link right here. So here's our QR code also okay and then uh, we have the link for paypal right here as well paypal.me forward slash the ahn show all right let's continue so uh i want to go to my powerpoint presentation and look at uh what pagan means okay because this is um a very important so that we get the terminology correct so and I deal with this in uh, the lecture, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Winter Solstice and the History of Christmas. Uh, also in uh, the online class, I teach Ancient uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade. We deal with pagan as well. Okay, so what is pagan? Uh, pagan is a word that is misused to speak negatively about a group of people. When we look at American Heritage Dictionary, uh, pagan as a noun, is explained as an, ad, an adherent of a polytheistic religion in antiquity and ad, an adherent of a polytheistic uh, religion in antiquity, especially when viewed in contrast to an adherent of a monotheistic religion. OK, so automatically. Right. They start. See, this is this goes back to what I was saying, right? When 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 they are trying to speak negatively, pejoratively about other religions in the, and, and religions in antiquity or spiritual systems, in comparison to Christianity, they.
they put these different terms on it. They'll say, oh, they were polytheistic. OK, therefore, that the religion is inferior. OK, and, and Christianity is is uh, superior. They, they say, oh, they were pagan. Oh, it was something primitive. These are these type of words that are used to denigrate uh, these other spiritual systems or religions. OK, now, if we if we look at this closer, uh, we look at we go down and look at the etymology of the word pagan, which in etymology just means the uh, study of word origins. Uh, it comes from the Middle English, which comes from uh, late Latin paganus, P-A-G-A-N-U-S, late Latin paganus, from the Latin, uh, from Latin, and it basically means country dweller or civilian, and it comes from the word pagus, P-A-G-U-S, which means country or rural district. OK, so in its original form, uh, coming from uh, uh, Pegasus and even Paganus in late Latin, it wasn't something negative. OK, it wasn't something like really negative. It was just something that was indigenous to a group of people, country, people who lived in the country, people who lived in rural districts. It's similar to today. When you talk about, uh, you may say, uh, uh, people in the country, uh, people down south, people in the country, they do this, they do that. They put sugar on grits or something. I don't know. I don't understand. I don't really eat grits. So sugar on grits without, I mean, I'm out of that conversation. But when, when you talk about people, you know, in, 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 the, in Alabama, they don't have shoes or something like that, whatever. It, it's basically saying that. Um, is talking about behavior or something that is practiced by people in the rural district or country, okay? It's not saying that these are heathens. It's not saying that uh, uh, the uh, spiritual system is inferior to Christianity or anything like that. But this is how that term gets thrown around and misused. All right, now, Uh, okay, so I wanted to talk about pagan, and then uh, we mentioned Easter as well. Okay, so it's important to uh, also deal with this with Easter. And because in the article from history.com, they mentioned uh, monotheistic and polytheistic, or uh, the definition here. Uh, I'm going to deal with that in a, in a minute as well, because and the reason why it's important to understand this is because when you look at Roman mythology and the Roman religion, their deities were heavily influenced by deities coming out of ancient Africa, especially the Nile Valley region of Africa. Nile Valley region of Africa, specifically ancient Kim and ancient Egypt. And even in Christianity, we're going to see the influence from the Netaru or the deities of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. We're going to see that influence um, deities and stories, et cetera, in Christianity. Okay, so let's look at this here dealing with uh, Easter. And let me go to that, uh, where is that? That is page, that is slide. What is it here? Just a second, let me find this. Okay, right here, what is Easter? And I wanna go to what determines when Easter is celebrated? Okay, we'll start right here. What determines when Easter is celebrated? Because all, all of this is connected. And the reason why I have to deal with this is because of the term pagan. And then we hear about monotheism, monotheism, polytheism. And we're reading about Patrick uh, 
converting the Irish to Christianity and the Irish were dealing with a nature-based religion. The nature-based religion that the Irish were dealing with was a watered down version of the teachings coming out of the Nile Valley region of Africa. Okay. Coming from ancient Kemet. And this is what's going to be taught to the Druids. Okay. The priestly Kings there in Ireland, the Druids. See, people don't really understand how deep this stuff is. Um, and the Druids and I, uh, let me see, we, we got the slide of the Druids here. Let me go to this because I had the uh, what I put it right here. I'm going to come to this in a minute. The suppression of the knowledge and the fight against the Druids, because this is who Patrick was fighting against. And the Druids were dealing with a watered down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. And the word Druid in Old Irish means he who knows, he who knows. The Druids were dealing with and teaching what was called the Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, the Gnosis. And the Gnosis was called the true knowledge. And what the Druids were teaching, which was, as I said, a watered down version of the teachings coming from our ancestors, out of ancient Africa, especially the Nile Valley region of Africa, it was at odds with what the Christian church and what the Roman empire wanted taught. Because Ireland at this time was a colony of not, Brit not Great Britain. They become a colony of Great Britain in the 1155 common era, uh, or England, colony of England. This was, a colony of the Roman Empire. So 432 AD, uh, Pope Celestine I sends Patrick into Ireland to convert the Irish to Christianity. This is before the fall of the Western portion of the Roman Empire, which you know was 476 AD when the Vandals and the Visigoths crushed the Western portion of the Roman Empire. And this casts Europe into what we call the Dark Ages, and it's going to be those African Moors, unfortunately, in 711 AD, who go in and uh, take the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa. They take the light of ancient Africa into Europe. And this is what's going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. And everything we taught Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. When you study that history, everything we taught them came back to kick us in the behind. Okay. Now, let's look at this. Everybody all right? Like I said, I'm, I, I may say some things that are outside the circumference of your own awareness, but <laughs> like Juvenile had a song in 1999, back that thing up. I can back that thing up. I can back up what I say. Proper documentation ends all conversation. All right, now, uh, let's go to, I want to go back to my slides. All right, uh, here we go. Okay, let's look at Easter. Easter, Easter, Oyster. What determines when Easter is celebrated? Now, the complicated dating for Easter was set in 325 AD common era at the council at the first council of Nicaea, the first council of Nicaea, which scheduled the festival to be celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon occurring next after the vernal equinox. So Easter celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. That occurs March 20th, March 21st, uh, usually. And uh, this was determined at the first council of Nicaea. However, if the full moon occurs on a Sunday, Easter will be celebrated the following Sunday. So Easter is a movable feast, okay? Easter is a movable feast. We know Christians celebrate Easter is the most significant Christian holiday that uh, commemorates the resurrection of Yeshua, uh, who we've been taught to call Jesus. That is the anglicized version of the name Yeshua with the Y, 
because the letter J wasn't invented till 1638 AD, but that's a that's another conversation. Hence, the date of Easter can fluctuate between March 22nd and April 5th because the Western churches, Catholic and Protestant, now follow the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar is introduced about 1583 by Pope Gregory the 13th as a result of the Third Council of Trent, which is about 1582 AD. Uh, now follow the Gregorian calendar, the Eastern churches, which followed the unrevised Julian calendar, the Julian calendar, which was the calendar that was um, used prior to the Gregorian calendar being introduced. Okay. The unrevised Julian calendar celebrates Easter and other church holidays on different dates in the Orthodox churches, Orthodox Christian churches, Easter marks the beginning of the ecclesiastical year. For more information on that, go to encyclopedia.com. Look at the Gale Encyclopedia, G-A-L-E, the Gale Encyclopedia of Food and Culture uh, under their entry for Easter. They have a good, uh, some good information there. Now, where does the name Easter come from? Okay. Now, the the English monk known as Bede or Saint Bede, B-E-D-E, -E, the Venerable Bede, the eighth century author of, histo of ecclesiastical history of the English people, maintains that the English word Easter comes from Eostra, E-O-S-T-R-E, Eostra, or Eostre, E-O-S-T-R-A-E. And this was the Anglo-Saxon goddess or deity of spring and fertility, the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility. Now, other historians maintain that Easter, the word Easter, derives in uh, uh, Albus, a Latin phrase, uh, derives from the uh, Latin phrase in Albus, a Latin phrase that's plural for Alba or dawn, D-A-W-N. That became uh Eostarum, E-O-S-T-A-R-U-M, in Old High German, which was a precursor to the English language of today. Despite its significance as a Christian holy day, many of the traditions and symbols that play a key role in Easter observances actually have roots in pagan celebrations. Okay, now don't throw holy water at me, okay? <laughs> I am not making this up. Go, re go research this, okay? So, like I said, pagan is not a bad thing necessarily, okay? So don't, you know, somebody's saying some Hail Marys for me now, something, whatever. But this, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, when you get into this history, right, you start understanding how when people conquer other people, oftentimes traditions and celebrations that the conquered were celebrating elements get incorporated into celebrations of the conqueror. Despite the significance um, as a Christian holy day, many of the traditions and symbols that play a key role in Easter observances actually have roots in pagan celebrations, particularly the pagan goddess or deity Eostra, E-O-S-T-R-E, -E, and in the Jewish holiday of Passover. Okay, now when I do my presentation dealing with Easter, which we we'll probably do in April, I think we'll get deeper into this. Okay, but just to give you just a basic understanding of, of, of this right now, because we're going to see this play out when we deal with St. Patrick and the Druids and the Roman Empire forcing Christianity on the Irish. Okay, now very quickly, the, the goddesses Eostra and Ostara, who were they? The name Easter may have come from Eostra, E-O-S-T-R-E, or Eostra, E-A-S-T-R-E, -E, the Teutonic or Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility, whose feast was celebrated around the start of spring. Now, we know that spring, based upon the Gregorian calendar, occurs on the first Monday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. So it's about March 20th, March 21st. All right. And it's called spring because things started growing. They started springing up and the season is called fall because leaves start falling. Things start falling. OK, now, Eostra uh, or, East, or Eostra is associated with the hare, H-A-R-E, 
and egg, both symbols of creation. The hare, the rabbit. Okay, so this is believed. This is it's believed. This is where the bunny rabbit, the Easter bunny, comes from. Because you have to ask the question: Why are we teaching our children that rabbits lay chicken eggs? Where the hell? Who came up with something like that? And why do we just perpetuate things that we've been programmed to do and don't ask questions? You got to take it back to Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango, African people and European holidays and mental genocide. OK, why do we teach or some of us at least teach our children that rabbits lay chicken eggs? Where did that come from? So. Uh, the uh, the Teutonic or Anglo-Saxon goddess Istra or Eostra, whose feast was celebrated around the start of spring, she is associated with the hare, the rabbit, and egg, both symbols of creation. Ostara is a no, Ostara, O S T A R A, is a Germanic goddess who was always accompanied by a hare, a rabbit, possibly the ancestor of our modern Easter bunny. The association of both the rabbit and eggs with Easter is prob probably the vestige of an ancient springtime fertility rite. Okay, so it, like Professor X, the overseer, overseeing the black watch, said it gets deeper with a Nat Turner link, you know, <laughs> years of the nine on the black hand side, right? <laughs> At the crossroads with the key. <laughs> so <laughs> you're taking it back to the X clan. All right, let's continue. Um, okay, now Patrick was uh, the, is the patron saint to Ireland, right? The patron saint to Ireland. So you may ask the question, well, Michael M. Hotel, what is a patron saint? I'm glad you asked that question. That's a very good question. Let's look at this. Okay, now a patron saint is, uh, if we look at Britannica Concise Encyclopedia, a patron saint is a saint to whose protection and intercession a person, society, church, place, profession, or activity is dedicated. Okay, now, once again, the concept of the patron saints, this comes from the Neturu in ancient Kemet, or, or Netur for singular, in ancient Kemet, who are the deities, and when you, when Europeans interpreted african spirituality they said that african people believed in many gods which is not true we we had the supreme being but we just had different manifestations of that one supreme being different manifestations of that supreme principle you they do the same thing okay uh, europeans do the same thing with christianity what happened was was the patron saints replaced the net to root. so now the patron saints have attributes just like the Neturu had attributes and they were emissaries and uh, different cities in, in ancient Kemet had a net, had a netter that uh, was said to be the netter of that city and watched over the people. You see the same thing in Christianity, but they're called patron saints. One gets one gets denigrated. The other gets elevated. You see the same thing in Black Panther, Wakanda forever. Right. Uh, Bastet or Bast is the uh, is the deity that watches over the people of Wakanda. OK, well, Bast comes from Bastet, which was a netter, a, a netter that had the body of a woman and the head of a cat uh, coming from ancient Egypt. This is where the, the, the movie Black Panther is deep. They went deep into African history and culture, African mythology, spiritual systems, all of that African language. They went. I did three months of research uh, on that on that movie to be able to do my lectures on it. They went deep into this. Okay, now even the word Wakanda, Wakanda comes from the Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian uh, languages. It means possesses secret powers. Amongst the Osaji, oh, uh, Wakanda is the name of their deity, but there's also it's also a key Congo, uh, which is a Bantu language as well. So the movie Black Panther is, is so deep. Uh, most of our people don't understand like how much African culture and history and spiritual systems are in that movie. OK. 
Uh, let's let me keep going because I'm trying to keep this to an hour. Um, so the choice is usually made on the so a patron saint is a saint to whose protection and intercession a person, society, church, place, profession, or activity is dedicated. The choice is usually made on the basis of some real or presumed relationship. For example, St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland because he is credited with introducing Christianity to Ireland. Now, some other famous patron saints, St. Maurice, who was an African Moor, St. Maurice was the patron saint of Germany. OK, St. Nicholas is the patron saint of Amsterdam and Russia. St. Nicholas, the, 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 the real life Nicholas, who the uh, secular character had the little children, who the secular character of Santa Claus is based upon. And then also the, the character uh, amongst the Dutch of center class, because center class in Dutch means St. Nicholas. Right. So we look at, you know, you, you, we, I've talked about center class and Joie de Piet before, Black Pete, Joie de Piet the Moor, and it's celebrated amongst the Netherlands going to, to early uh, November. Uh, they uh, celebrate with uh, center class coming into uh, the Netherlands on a steamship, a steamboat from Spain with uh, uh, Joie de Piet, and they have uh, Europeans that put on blackface and afro wigs and they put on a regalia from like the uh, 18th century or something like that 17th 18th century and they have parades where uh this is you have center class and joie de piet now joie de piet is a helper of center class center class in dutch means saint nicholas and it's from, and, and you see the picture here, center class. He has a red cape. He has a white outfit, long white beard. And it's from that red and white in that particular outfit that you get the secular figure here in America of uh, Santa Claus. And the, the cartoonist Thomas Nast, N-A-S-T, is the one who's really credited with introducing the secular figure of Santa Claus uh, uh, in America with the red outfit and the white beard and the jolly fat fellow, things of this nature. Okay, that's a whole nother presentation that I've done numerous times before, but that's another presentation. But all this history intersects, okay? All right, now let's continue. Okay, how's everybody doing? Give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast. And be sure to, if you like this type of information, be sure to register for the 12 week, the, the 10 week, ain't 12 weeks, the 10 week online history course that I teach on Saturdays, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. The Ma'afa is a key Swahili term, which means uh, the great disaster. That's our Holocaust. That's the transatlantic slave trade. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So we get deep into uh, a lot of this history in, in, in that class. Is that our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com? You can register for it. I teach it at our online school, and uh, our full 10 week uh, uh, lesson plan is right there on the homepage of the website to download, also. Okay. All right. So uh, we were talking about patron saints. Okay. So, yes, yeah, St. Maurice, you have uh, St. Patrick, you have St. Nicholas. You also have another patron saint, St. Benedict the Moor of uh, Palermo. Palermo and San, Frate San Fratello, uh, Sicily. Okay, he was also called Immoro, uh, it, it, and, uh, which is Italian for dark skinned. Okay, uh, Saint Benedict the Moor. Now, I was laying out to you because I'm, I'm, I'm about to come to the uh, part where we deal with Patrick and the Druids, but I, I have the latest history out here. Now, I was talking about how the Neturu uh, were replaced by the patron saints, okay? And we see this conflict between spiritual systems coming from Africa and European Christianity, okay? Uh, and I say European Christianity because early Christianity prior to the first council of Nicaea, and there's like 21 ecumenical councils, Council of Ephesus and Nicaea, uh, Council of Trent, things like this. Early Christianity, prior to the first Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, looked a lot like 
African spiritual systems. A lot of early, uh, a lot of your early Christian saints were, um, a lot of your early Christian saints were Africans. And a lot of early Christians believed in some form of what we would today call reincarnation. So a lot, so early Christianity looked a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. So research the first council of Nicaea 325 AD. Uh, Dr. Walter Williams has information on that, as well as uh, Dr. Ray Hagens. And you can go to Britannica.com and look that up also. All right. Now, if we look at, uh, I want to go to this piece here. So we look quickly at the Neto Um Okay, let's look at this. Page 95, A Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. And this is a fantastic, fantastic book by one of my friends, Tony Browder. Browder is a brilliant, a brilliant historian. Uh, I originally bought the first copy of this book I bought in 1994. And I got this new copy April 30th, 2022 at the One Africa Power and Unity Conference that uh, Hapi, Brother Taki Grant and Sister Felicia put on here in Detroit. But this book deals with thousands of years of history. Okay. Uh, now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. If we look here at page 95 of Now Valley Contributions to Civilization, and I have this expanded, page 95, uh, Browder says, this deals with the historical accomplishments of Kemet. Kemet's one of the original names for Egypt. Browder says, in 1984 at the Now Valley Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Charles Kofer, C-O-P-H-E-R, uh, professor of Old Testament at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, discussed the role of Egypt and Ethiopia in the Old Testament. He stated the following. In the King James and Revised Standard Versions of the Bible, the word Egypt, uh, in, in Hebrew is Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, in M-I-T. Z R A I M. The word Egypt, along with cognates, occurs some 740 times in the Old Testament. The word translated Ethiopia and or Cush, C U S H, Cush in Hebrew, along with cognates, and including three instances of duplication in the references, appears 58 times in the King James Version. In this version, the translation Ethiopia is used 39 times. Cush, C-U-S-H, untranslated with cognates 19 times. The numerous references to Egypt led one Old Testament scholar to remark, quote, no other land is mentioned so frequently as Egypt in the Old Testament, end quote. To understand Israel, one must look well into Egypt. Okay, now. Browder goes on to say, so he was quoting Dr. Charles Kofer, professor of Old Testament. So Browder goes on to say, the story of Asar, Oset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, is the first story in the recorded history of man of a holy royal family, the Trinity. Now, this may go outside. The circumference of some people's awareness. I know it is. I know somebody is saying, uh, you know, whatever they're saying. But <laughs> you you have to to understand the existence of something. You must first understand the pre-existence of existence. Okay. So if you read, for instance, um, Christianity before Christ, but Dr. John G. Jackson, you get deep into this. If you read. Uh, the World 16 Crucified Saviors by Kersey Graves. All right. You'll get you'll get a better understanding. I like Chris, I like Christianity before Christ, but Dr. John G. Jackson, because he was one of our scholars. And um I, I know uh historians that knew him. Okay, so he was uh, uh African American, and I have his book somewhere around here. I got a bunch of stacks of books and a bunch of stacks of articles. But Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson. Dr. Jackson's book. It's around here. Okay, but anyway, let's continue. All 
All right, so let's go back to uh, page 95 of Nonviolent Contributions to Civilization. Okay, that is, where the hell is this? Right here, okay. Okay, the story of Asar Aset and Heru is the first story in the recorded history of man. The first story, oh, damn. the first story in the recorded history of man let me go back to that. I didn't mean to hit that. Of a holy royal family, the Trinity, Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, and Resurrection. Okay, Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, and Resurrection. Evidence of this Trinity is known to have existed in ancient uh, in ancient Nubia as late as 3,300 BCE, before the common era. Okay, let me repeat that. Evidence of this ancient, evidence of this Trinity is known to have existed in ancient Nubia as late as 3,300 BCE, before the common era, or BC, before Christ. Carved on the walls of the temple of Luxor, circa approximately 1380 bce before the common era are the scenes are scenes which depict the following okay number one the annunciation the annunciation the netter uh dehuti is shown announcing to the virgin or set who the greeks called isis the coming birth of their son heru who the greeks called Horus. Okay, so that is bottom number one. Dehuti, the Netter Dehuti, who the Greeks call Thoth, is shown announcing to the virgin or set the coming birth of their son Heru. This is called the Annunciation. Number two, the Immaculate Conception. The Netter Neph, K N E P H, who represents the Holy Ghost, who represents the Holy Ghost, and the Netter Het Heru. Uh, who the Greeks called Hathor, are shown symbolically impregnating or set by holding onx, which is the uh, African symbol for eternal life or the symbol of life, an onk, to the nostrils of the virgin mother-to-be. Okay, this is the Immaculate Conception. Then you have the virgin birth, okay, at the, at the top. Next to the Immaculate Conception, you have the virgin birth. All set is shown sitting on the birthing stool. And the newborn child is attended by midwives. OK, so we had mastered uh, science and medicine. Things of this nature. And we knew it made more sense to sit on a birthing stool and let gravity take its course. So you have the virgin birth. Then you have the adoration. The newborn Heru is portrayed receiving gifts from three kings or magi while being adored by a host of gods and men. OK, so this is an ancient story. Now, th this goes back to at least 3300 BCE before Christ. In ancient Nubia, or Ta-Nehisi, and Nubia is the mother of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. So, and when you read Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson, what's happened is, is this story has been told over and over and over again over thousands of years adapted to various people's cultures. That's why when you get into the world's 16 crucified saviors by Kersey Graves, he, he deals with that in there. And, and I would argue Dr. John G. Jackson does a better job of it. And I can't find my book. I think I used it. Yes, I was teaching my class yesterday. Where the hell is my book? Um, it's, where the hell? I don't, I don't know where it is. Because one of my book stacks fell over. So, uh, but anyway, it's somewhere around here. Um, let me see. I don't, I don't like it when I can't. I don't like it when I can't find things and can't just put my hand on something. 
But anyway, uh, the Ankh right here. So I encourage people to get a symbols um, encyclopedia. All right. This is the one that I use, a symbols encyclopedia. And when I teach my classes, I use a symbols encyclopedia. This this one is called Signs and Symbols, an illustrated guide to the origins and meanings. Now, if you look at the, the, the front of it, right, uh, you see ancient Africa. You see a pyramid. You see the caduceus. The caduceus comes straight out of ancient Kemet. That comes from the two staffs that the Houthi carried that had uh, a snake wrapped around each staff. And that comes from uh, uh, Mercury. OK. And uh, it, it, it comes from uh, Hermes and Mercury and the staffs that they carry. That's where the caduceus comes from, which is the universal symbol of medicine. When you see that, that's ancient Africa. OK. Uh, so you see that you see the eye of Heru. You see all this. So you see symbols coming from ancient Africa right here on the front and on the back. And in the middle, you see a uh, Ankh. OK, the African symbol of of life or eternal life, the Ankh. Now, when you open when you open this up, the first thing you see is Africa. That's Heru. In, in the form of a winged uh, in the form of a falcon. So, and I got this in 2011, so I got this 13 years ago. And you go through, they show you, this has about 2,000 symbols. Decode the secrets and, un and uncover the origins and meanings of over 2,000 symbols and signs from ancient hieroglyphs, that's the metal netter, that's straight out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, to modern day logos, okay? So when you, when you get a symbols, dictionary of symbols encyclopedia then you start reading all this you start decoding these symbols from around the world that uh relates right into uh history okay and helps you better understand history because you, you you're going to see these symbols coming from africa you're going to see this grow all around the world and a lot of these things we associate with the culture that borrowed them, or in some cases just stole them. Okay, so you look at here, page 138, 139, Egyptian deities. They lay this out right here. So this is a this is a good book. It's only about ten dollars. I got this. Uh, this is by uh, Covent C O V E N T Covent Garden Books is the publisher. This is about ten dollars. I got it at uh, I think it was Barnes and Noble back in 2011. All right, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast. Um, hopefully you're learning a lot. Okay, so let's go back to this. Okay, so we we talked about the uh, page 95, non Valley contributions to civilization, the Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, Adoration, etc., and how the story of a Sar all set in Heru goes back. Uh, the first Holy Trinity goes back to at least 3,300 BC in uh, ancient Nubia. Okay, now I talked about uh, the Houthi. All right, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to Patrick in just a minute, going into Ireland. But it's important to understand this this pretext history because we're going to see what happens when you have a clash between the teachings coming from ancient Africa and European Christianity under the Roman empire. Okay. Now this is page, uh, this is page 168. I think this is 168 of, um, now valid contributions to civilization. All right. And we, we see how the deities from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt influenced the deities amongst the uh, Romans, and uh, amongst the Greeks and the Romans. Yeah, this is page one sixty-eight. All right. Now we see the deity with the ibis, with the head of an ibis. Okay, that's Dehuti. And over to the left, there's a legend. Okay, that describes each one of these deities that we see. This is what it says: Dehuti, the netter of Hold on, let me go back to this. The Houthi, the netter of science, writing, measurement, 
divine articulation of speech and medicine, holds in his hand two staffs with entwined snakes. Two staffs with entwined snakes. One serpent wears the crown of Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt. The other wears the crown of Lower Kemet. Dahuti was referred to as Thoth by the Greeks. Okay, now remember, is Dahuti who delivers the uh, Annunciation? Okay, yeah, that's page one sixty-eight. Now, Valley Contributions to Civilization. So, if you have this book at home, pull it off the shelf, the, uh, blow the dust off of it, uh, pull it out, pull it, pull it off the shelf because class is in session. All right. Now, remember, we talked about Dahuti when we dealt with the um, Immaculate Conception and the virgin birth and the uh, adoration, okay? And we talked about this here. Where's the other slides here? Uh, I had uh, right here. Okay, we talked about the hootie right here. The Annunciation, the hootie is shown announcing to the virgin or set the coming birth of their son, Heru. That's page uh, 95 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Okay, now let's go back to this. Now, the second deity, the one in the middle, is Hermes, okay, amongst the Greeks. Now, Hermes was the Greek equivalent of Dahuti. He is shown carrying a staff which has two entwined snakes, a staff which has two entwined snakes. It was called the staff of Hermes, H-E-R-M-E-S. In Greek mythology, he was associated with the with wisdom and the hermetic sciences were named in his honor, okay? So I gotta deal with this before we go to the next part that's gonna blow you all away, okay? So we gotta deal with this first. Just a second. All right, let's continue. Okay, now, you've got Hermes, and the Hermetic sciences are named after Hermes, okay? In Greek mythology, he was associated with wisdom and the Hermetic sciences were named to his honor. Okay, now, the third one, so let's go back. You got Hermes right here, right? Hermes has uh, a staff. OK, uh, he is shown carrying a staff which has two entwined snakes right here. Hermes in the middle. Now you have Mercury. Now, Mercury is actually Roman. It says Greek here, but Mercury is Roman. Mercury is the Roman version of Hermes and the Houthi, and he is similar in all aspects. The staff that Mercury carries is called the Caduceus, and it has been adopted as the universal symbol of medicine. OK. So the caduces that you see, like right here, that comes straight out of Africa. That comes straight out of ancient Africa, specifically ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. All right. Now, so we see how the deities from uh, ancient Africa influence uh, Greece and, and Rome. Right. OK, now. Um, on that same page, page 168, it says, Greco-Roman mythology. Just as certain architectural stylings, which originated in Kemet, greatly influenced the Greeks and Romans, the same can be said for the Nile Valley concepts of the Netaru. OK, these are the deities, the Netaru. Now, they believed in one supreme force. It was Amun-Ra, Amun-Ra-Ptah. 
they believed in one supreme force. They dealt with the different manifestations of that one supreme force. So they're emissaries, they're helpers. They they uh, dealt with different manifestations of that one creative principle. Uh, the same can be said for the Nile Valley uh, concepts of the Neturu, whom the Greeks and Romans refer to as gods. Okay, the pyramid text in Kemet. Uh, around 3200 BCE, described a family of nine Neturu, okay, nine deities, nine Neturu, which became known as the Greek Ennead. And, and Ennead is a uh, Greek for the number nine. Ennead is the Greek word for nine. This term is derived from the Greek word Ennea, which means nine. The basic sources of Greek mythology, all of their primary characters and themes were contained in three classical works, Hesiod's Theogony and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which were all written in the 8th century BCE. During the, during the 3rd century BCE, the Romans began to closely identify with divinities of Greece. Okay, During the 3rd century BCE, before the Common Era, the Romans began to closely identify with divinities of Greece. Rome's classical literature of religious and moral teachings was written in the latter years of this first century BCE by the poet Virgil, V-I-R-G-I-L. This, this great work was called the Aeneid, A-E-N-E-I-D, and it consisted of 12 books. Virgil based the first books of the Odyssey on the Odyssey and the last six books were modeled after the Iliad. Virgil wrote the Aeneid, A-E-N-E-I-D, to establish the divinity of the Roman Empire, which he closely associated uh, with that of Greece. The, uh, uh, so then they go, uh, he goes through and shows similarities between deities from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the Greek equivalent, and the Roman equivalent. He talks about Amun, who was the ruler of the deities, um, uh, uh, Amun, uh, A -M -O -E, A -M -O -N, or Amen, A-M-E-N, which is why you have Amen at the end of your prayers in Christianity, because the early Christians went into the temples of the Amen priest and priestesshood to, um, uh, to worship, okay? And On the walls of the uh, of the temples were all these stories, okay? And they're going to write down these stories, right? But at the end of their prayers, they put the, they put the word "Amen" in honor of the Amen priest and priestesshood that allowed them to come in and worship, okay? Like I, and like I said, a lot of your early Christians and a lot of your early Christian saints prior to the first Council of Nicaea were Africans, and this is something that. Um, I've talked to Professor Kaba uh, Hiawatha Kamenei about as well. Professor Kaba, you know, I've interviewed him numerous times, uh, over 12 times over the years. Okay, so take a look at this here. This goes uh, through and looks at different uh, deities. Bess, uh, Dahuti, uh, 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 Het Heru, uh, the e Greek, Greek equivalent is Aphrodite. The Roman equivalent is Venus, goddess of love and beauty. When we look at... Uh, Heru or Horus, uh, the Greek equivalent Apollo and Apollo amongst the Romans, the son of God also associated with light and sun. Imhotep, the Greek equivalent is Asclepius, okay, uh, deity of healing. And you have Neat, uh, the Greek equivalent is Athena uh, and the Roman equivalent, equivalent Minerva, goddess of crafts, war and wisdom. All right, now. I say that to get to this right here. And I'm looking at my notes to make sure I covered this and went in order. Okay, so we did all that. All right, now let's look at, and I've got it. It's going to be even better. We've got it right here. Okay, because I scanned this page. So let's look at this. Now let's tie this all together and deal with... Um, Patrick, let's deal with the conflict between the Druids in Ireland 
and the Christian church in the Roman Empire. Okay. Because this is going to blow you away right here. This comes from page 193 of Nine Valley Contributions to Civilization. Okay, page 193 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Uh, the development of European secret societies. The development of European secret societies. And I'm going to start in the margin here. Okay. Uh, Dehuti, who we just talked about, who developed the who who delivered the Annunciation to the Virgin All Set? Dehuti was known to Europeans as Hermes Trismegistus, as Hermes Trismegistus. Okay, a uh, thrice a uh, thrice great, three times great philosopher, priest, and king. He regarded as the god of wisdom, science, medicine, magic, measurement. Uh, mathematics, and he is said to have authored innumerable books on these and other subjects, okay? Hermes Trismegistus. Masons or Freemasons regard him as the author of all Masonic initiatory rituals. Okay, let's increase the size of this here. Masons or Freemasons regard him as the author of all Masonic initiatory rituals. Hermes is said to have been the author of 42 books which, which contain the wisdom of ancient Egypt and Kemet. According to Manly P. Hall, quote, the Romans and later the Christians. Okay, now, see, this is like really critical right here. The Romans and later the Christians realized that until these books were eliminated, they could never bring the ancient Egyptians into subjugation. Until these 42 books of ancient wisdom were eliminated, they could never bring the ancient Egyptians into subjugation. Books on the Hermetic sciences were said to contain the said to contain information regarding Egyptians understanding of immortality which was based on the knowledge that the body is the tomb of the soul the body is the tomb of the soul during the greco-roman occupation of egypt the soldiers formed a secret body the greek and roman soldiers formed a secret body for specialized scholarship and training in the hermetic sciences in the hermetic sciences they became known as druids and later moved from egypt into greece and rome before establishing a school in ireland so now you have the druids who are dealing with teachings coming from the Nile Valley region of Africa, ancient Kemet, and they're taking these teachings into Ireland. Oh, now we have a problem. Now we have a problem. Well, what, what, what's the problem? Okay, well, let's look at this. This comes from page 193 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. The Nile Valley presence in Europe, the development of European secret societies, the Nile Valley presence in Europe, the development of European secret societies. One of the most enduring aspects of Nile Valley civilization was the proliferation of its scientific and philosophical thought which became known outside of ancient Kemet as the mystery schools, okay, which became known outside of ancient Kemet as the mystery schools or the hermetic sciences. From the earliest of times, the masses of Europeans 
were poor and ignorant, while only the most fortunate men, noblemen, lords, scribes, and various religious leaders were provided with an education. Of this group, an even smaller number knew how to adequately, adequately read or write. So you may have the top 10% who are looked at as uh, educated, were provided education, but maybe only the top 1% or maybe the top 5% actually knew how to read and write. And we know when the Moors go in, in 711 AD, you know, probably 80, 85% of Europeans are illiterate. You had kings and queens who couldn't read or write. So of this group, even smaller, knew how to adequately read or write. Okay, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, but when you start studying ancient history, you start learning this. The dogma of Christianity was readily available for the masses of people. Now, keep in mind, in Europe, the masses of people were poor and ignorant and couldn't read or write. They couldn't read the Bible that they were told was the word of God. The dogma of Christianity was readily available for the masses of people. You should say masses of poor people. While the educated elite studied the ancient teachings, which were called the gnosis or true knowledge. Well, wait a second. Hold on, time out. Wait a second, hold on. If the ruling elite, the educated ruling elite in Europe are studying a watered-down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, and they're calling that the gnosis or true knowledge, and the ruling elite are in control of, one, keeping the masses poor and ignorant, Two, making sure they're illiterate, can't read. Three, giving them, don't take this the wrong way. I ain't make this history up. Giving them Christianity. Then you have to say, well, whoa, 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 whoa. hold on, what's going on? The dogma of Christianity was readily, now this, I'm not attacking anybody's religion. I'm saying we have to understand this history. The dogma of Christianity was readily available for the masses of people, while the educated elite studied the ancient teachings, which were called gnosis or true knowledge. The newly emerging schools of Hermetic, Neoplatonic, and Gnostic thought in Europe were loosely based on the Nile Valley principles of education, okay, which was called the mystery system. The mystery school, the teachings coming out of ancient Africa. This is what they, they're studying a watered down version of that. Okay. The newly emerging schools of Hermetic, Neoplatonic, and Gnostic thought in Europe were loosely based on the Valley principles of education, which were designed to awaken within an individual the knowledge of self, the knowledge of self. This knowledge of self led to an awareness of the powers of God, the creator, Amin Ra, the supreme being, Olo du Mare, whatever it is. This knowledge led to an awareness of the powers of God, which exists with the man as expressed in the myths of, of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Let's go, let's go to a, a, a famous picture. Uh, uh, I mean, a, a famous um, statue of them. Let me see. I think I have it here in this PowerPoint. Yeah, right here. Let's go to this. Okay. See, see, now all this is coming together. You got to understand how all this history comes together, right? Asar or Set and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. The evidence of this story goes back to at, as late as 3300 BCE before the Common Era in ancient Nubia, Tana Hesse. Okay, now, 
let's continue because we about to really get into it okay i hope i hope everybody's sitting down i hope nobody's driving right now okay i don't want to be responsible for any accidents okay <laughs> all right now let's see here let's go back to this uh all right here this is what i want right here all right give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like on this broadcast hopefully you're learning a lot the knowledge th this knowledge itself led to an awareness of the powers of god which exists within man as expressed in the myths of asar or set in heru this philosophy was in direct conflict with christianity this con this this philosophy of awakening within you the power of god it's not saying god doesn't exist it's saying that you come from the source and you are supposed to acquire knowledge and achieve spiritual awakening and elevate your conscious level to awaken with inside of you the power of the creator Okay, it's not saying that you it's not saying that a supreme being doesn't exist. It's not saying that you are greater to the supreme being or equal to it. It's saying no, you have power with inside of you as well. Okay, as, as Professor James Small, one of my teachers, puts it, we're God having a human experience. We're God having a human experience. Okay. All right. So this these teachings from ancient Kemet. From ancient Africa are in direct conflict with European Christianity, which taught that man was conceived in sin and that salvation could only be gained through Jesus the Christ, Yeshua, the Pope, or other accepted intermediaries. They're saying, wait a second, no, for us to have control over people, we have to, number one, keep them poor and ignorant. Two, make sure they can't read. Three, don't take this the wrong way. Three, make sure the dogma of Christianity is really readily available for the masses of people while the educated ruling elite are going to deal with the watered down version of teachings coming out of ancient Africa that they call Gnosis, that Europeans call Gnosis or true knowledge. This is what's going on. Now, one example of the clash between these opposing ideologies can be found by studying the symbolism incorporated in the story of St. Patrick and the Druids of Ireland. Uh-oh. You you mean you mean this you mean this is there's more to this than shamrocks and and leprechauns and and drinking green beer and getting drunk? And wearing kiss me i'm irish t-shirts you mean you you mean there's some deep history behind this Let, let's look at this peter tompkins in his wonderful book secrets of the great pyramid provided a clue to this mystery in a brief overview of the druids he said druid in old ireland in in the old irish language meant he who knows he who knows Julius Caesar, our earliest uh, source on the subject, considered the Druids highly educated and well organized. In Debello Gallico, he commented, it is especially the object of the Druids to inculcate that souls do not perish, S-O-U-L-S, -S, souls do not perish, but after death pass into other bodies and they can and they consider that by this belief more than anything else men can be led to cast away the fear of death men can be led to cast away the fear of death and to become courageous they discuss many points concerning the heavenly bodies and their motion the extent of the universe and the world the nature of things, the influence and ability of the immortal gods, and they instruct the youth in these things. Okay, now, Browder goes on to say, the Druids were also known to dress in a style similar 
to the priestly kings of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Their heads were adorned with a uraeus. Okay, the, a uraeus was the symbol of the cobra that was worn on the crown of the pharaoh or Nesubiti in ancient Kemet. Because of this symbolic imagery, the Druids were often referred to by outsiders as the snake people. Okay, so now here you have uh, an image. Uh, this is Hermes Trismegistus. He has a hat. He has the caduceus. You see him with the caduceus uh, next to him, all right? But the Druids wore, wore a, a, a helmet, okay, or their headdress with a uraeus on it, a cobra. Because of this symbolic imagery, the Druids were often referred to by the out by outsiders as the snake people. Their presence and ideology were viewed as a as a direct threat to the development of Christianity in Ireland. So the Roman Empire wants to expand Christianity in the Ireland. The Druids are dealing with uh, a watered down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. So like Robin Harris said, gotta go, gotta go. Okay. So in 430, here's what happened in 432 common era. Hold on. Where am I? In 432 AD. Pope, Pope Celestine the first sent a former British slave named Patrick to the region to convert the populace into Christianity. In the name of Christianity, Patrick's army slew, L-S-L-E-W, or killed thousands of Irishmen, and he is said to have founded more than 300 churches and baptized more than 120,000 people. Now, some people would say, well, he ain't killed. They're exaggerating how many he killed. Maybe he just killed a few thousand. Maybe it wasn't 20, 30 or something like that. Okay. This is a lot of exaggeration. Okay. What, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000? That doesn't make you feel better? Patrick also introduced the Roman alphabet and Latin literature into Ireland. Patrick was rewarded by the Vatican with sainthood. And today, millions of people throughout the world celebrate St. Patrick on his feast day, March 17th. To the average person who dresses in green, and green wasn't even Patrick's color. His color, Patrick's color was blue. We're going to come to that in just a minute. To the average person who dresses in green, wears shamrocks, and marches in St. Patrick's Day Parade, this day commemorates the myth of a man who drove the who drove the snakes out of Ireland. What most people fail to realize is that the snakes that St. Patrick drove into the sea were not the snakes that crawled on the ground, but the snake people who walked on two feet and were once known as Druids because there's no evidence of there ever being snakes in Ireland. So, so in other words, Patrick was a mass murderer on behalf of the Christian church who was sent into Ireland to kill the Druids who were dealing with a watered down version of teachings coming from our ancestors and to force Christianity on the Irish. Now, you can celebrate that if you want to. I don't participate in that stuff. Because I've studied the history of what the hell all this stuff is. I don't, you, you can do that if you want to. But <laughs> not me, no, not your boy. I'm the, I, I already know what it's about. Okay, now, let's look at this. So you've got the Druids being killed because what they're teaching is too powerful and the Roman Empire is trying to conquer the Irish and they're standing in the way. Now, so there was a good article from National Geographic dealing with uh, were snakes ever in Ireland? Okay. Uh, snakeless in Ireland, blame Ice Age, not St. Patrick. Uh, there's a good article from um, the uh, National Geographic on this. Let's see, where is that one? 
uh let me pull this up here because i hear i hear adults talking about the repeating these myths uh patrick drove the the snakes out of ireland all, all types of things like this and, and i have to sit back and so i start asking people well you know how do you research that what, what are your sources where do you get that information from and then it causes people to start thinking and they realize, you know, so we were taught by our parents and our teachers in school to participate in this, not blaming anybody. They did the best that they could. And then we do, we perpetuate the same thing to our children. Okay, let's see here. Uh, let me pull this up. All right, so this article is... Let's go to this one here from National Geographic. If you like this type of information, also, we'll go to this article here in just a minute. Uh, number one, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We are celebrating our 14th uh anniversary of me broadcasting the african history network show 14th year anniversary I first started uh march 10th 2010 march 10th 2010 also visit our website uh, africanhistorynetwork.com because you can register for the uh online history classes that i teach on saturdays uh 2 p.m eastern standard time uh ancient kemet one of the original names for egypt ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa uh, the moth is a key Swahili term, which means uh, the great disaster refers to our Holocaust, the transatlantic slave trade. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, so we do uh, Saturdays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next class is Saturday, March 16th, March 23rd, uh, March 23rd, March 30th, uh, April, I think it's April 6th. Uh, I'm going to update these dates on the website, April 6th, April 13th, April 20th. OK, and we have the uh, click right here to register here. We have uh, you can view our lesson plan. We have the lesson plans for uh, the introductory session and uh, all uh, 10 uh, class sessions is all laid out here. And you can click right here to download it. OK. All right. So we'll see you in class. The information is PG-13. So you can use this with your children also. All right. Let's look at this article here. Here's the real reason why there are. Uh, why there aren't any snakes in Ireland. Here's the real reason why there are not any snakes in Ireland. This is from uh, National Geographic. All right, let's look at this here. Uh, let's go back. St. Patrick has gotten all the credit for driving all the snakes out of Ireland, but science tells a different story. This is the truth behind the legend. This is an article from August 16th, 2018 by James Owens, James Owen for National Geographic. Uh, and in the article, let's see, let's skip down. Uh, it's, it's one of only a handful of places worldwide, including New Zealand, Iceland, Greenland, and Antarctica where Indiana Jones and other snake averse humans can visit without fear. They're talking about Ireland. Okay. He says, but legends hold, but legend holds that the Christian missionary, uh, Patrick rid the slithering reptiles from Ireland shores as he converted its people from paganism. See, there's that word again, paganism during the fifth century AD. St. Patrick supposedly chased the snakes into the sea after they began attacking him during a 40-day feast he undertook on top of a hill. An unlikely tale, perhaps, yet Ireland is unusual for its absence of native snakes. Uh, let's see. But Patrick has nothing to do with Ireland's snake-free sta status, scientists say. As keeper of natural history at the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin, Ni Nigel Monaghan uh, has, has trawled 
through vast collections of fossil and other records of Irish animals. Quote, at no time has there ever been any suggestion of snakes in Ireland. So there was nothing for St. Patrick to banish, Nigel Monaghan said. So what did happen? Most scientists uh, point to the most recent ice age, which kept the island too cold for reptiles until it ended 10,000 years ago. After the ice age, surrounding seas may have kept snakes from colonizing the Emerald Isle, the Emerald Isle. Why there are really no snakes in Ireland? Once the ice caps and woolly mammoths retreated back northward, snakes returned to northern and western Europe, spreading as far as the Arctic Circle. Britain, which had a land bridge to mainland Europe until about 6,500 years ago, was colonized by three snake species, the venomous adder, the grass snake, and the smooth snake. But Ireland, but Ireland's land link to Britain was cut some 2,000 years earlier by seas swollen by the melting glaciers, uh, Nigel Monaghan noted. Animals that reached Ireland before the sea became an impassable barrier, be, animals that reached Ireland before the sea became an impassable barrier, including brown bears, wild boars, and lynxes, but, quote, snakes never made it, end quote, he said. Okay, so read the rest of this here. And there are other articles dealing with this as well that deal with the fact that snakes were not in Ireland for Patrick to drive out. But keep in mind, it was the snake people, the Druids, that he was banishing by, by killing them. Okay, so that's from National Geographic. Uh, <clears throat> Now there is uh, okay. Let me look at my notes. Okay, so we did snakeless in Ireland. This is a good article from uh, history.com, official website of the History Channel. Seven surprising facts about uh, St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. Seven surprising facts about St. Patrick's Day. And if we just look at this briefly here, some of this we've already uh, dealt with and debunked. Uh, the first one is uh, the real St. Patrick was born in Britain. Okay, so he wasn't born in Ireland. He was born in Britain. Seven St. Patrick's Day legends and myths debunked. This is uh, updated February 27, 2024. Okay, uh, though one of Ireland's patron saints, Patrick was born in what is now England, Scotland, or Wales. That's that Great Britain area. Interpretations vary widely. He was born to a Christian deacon and his wife probably around the year 390 AD, common era. Okay, so read that. Uh, St. Patrick uh, was British. Number two, St. Patrick was British. His birthplace doesn't mean Patrick was, it was so seven myths debunked. So he was born in what would be classified as Great Britain, either England, Scotland, or Wales, okay? When we look at, uh, you have, uh, when we look at ancestry, so that's a little different. St. Patrick was British, uh, the myth, St. Patrick was British. His birthplace doesn't mean Patrick was a Brit, however, at least not technically. During his lifetime, the British Isles were occupied by the Romans, and a, a group that included Patrick's parents and thus the saint himself. It is unknown whether his family, thought to have been part of the Roman aristocracy, was indigenous, was indigenous Celts. Let's see. It is unknown whether his family, thought to have been part of the Roman aristocracy, was of indigenous Celtic descent or hailed from modern day Italy. When Patrick penned the two surviving documents attributed to him, he wrote in Latin and signed his name Patricius, P-A-T-R-I-C-U-S, 
but according to some accounts, he was born Maywin Suckett, uh, M-A-E-W-Y-N-S-U-C-C-A-T. Okay, now, um, the, the, uh, the third myth, St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland in 431 AD, or common era, before Patrick began preaching in Ireland, Pope Celestine I reportedly sent a bishop known as Palladius, as I said earlier, Palladius, to the Irish believing in Christ, an indication that some residents of the Emerald Isle uh, of Ireland had already converted by then. One theory holds that St. Patrick, that the St. Patrick of lore or folklore is actually an amalgam, uh, uh, an amalgam or amalgamation of two men, Palladius and the deacon's son who first visited Ireland as enslaved men. OK, then we talk about uh, it's a myth that Patrick banished uh, the snakes from Ireland and um, green is a myth that green has historically been associated with St. Patrick's Day. The Irish countryside may be uh, many shades of green, but knights in the order of St. Patrick wore a color known as St. Patrick's blue. Knights in the order of St. Patrick wore a color known as St. Patrick's blue. Why did green become so emblematic of St. Patrick that people began drinking green beer, Wearing hey, you, green with the small the business, court. drinking green beer. Okay, uh, why did green become so emblematic of St. Patrick that people began drinking green beer, wearing green, and of course, dyeing the Chicago River green to mark the holiday he inspired? The association probably dates back to the 18th century when supporters of Irish independence used the color green to represent their cause, okay? So green wasn't even his color either, all right? Uh, so read the rest of this here. Uh, and corned beef is a classic St. Patrick's Day uh, dish. That's a myth also. All right, so read the rest of this. Uh, seven myths, seven St. Patrick's Day legends and myths debunked. This is at history.com, official website of the History Channel. All right. Now, uh, there was a article that I saw dealing with uh, uh, Montserrat, the Caribbean island of Montserrat, and how Africans on that Caribbean island have a commemoration on uh, St. Patrick's Day but it's not for St. Patrick, okay? And Essence.com has an article about this. It's also an article from uh, BusinessInsider.com that came out in uh, 2023 uh, that deals with this as well. But if we look at this piece here from Essence.com, and I saw it earlier today on Instagram, and a friend of mine as well sent it to me through Instagram uh, also. So I told her I would... Uh, talk about it on tonight's show, today's show. Yes, a Caribbean, yes, a Caribbean island celebrates St. Patrick's Day. Here's why. This is the name of the article from Essence.com. Let's pull this up. Yes, a Caribbean island celebrates St. Patrick's Day. Here's why. Beyond the parades and parties, Montserrat's St. Patrick's Day festival commemorates the enslaved Africans who lost their lives, the enslaved Africans who lost their lives when their planned rebellion for March 17th, 1776 was uncovered. How many people have heard this history? Uh, so this article was updated March 17th, 2024. There is only one place outside of Ireland that celebrates St. Patrick's Day as a national public holiday, the island of, Mont uh, of Montserrat. The small pear-shaped island in about, is about 40 square miles and is located just south of Antigua. It is known as the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean, the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean. Montserrat 
hosts an annual 10 day celebration leading up to the holiday on March 17th, a 10 day celebration leading up to the holiday on March 17th, known as the St. Patrick's Festival. Past highlight past highlights have included early morning street jams, music concerts featuring some of the biggest names in reggae and soca music, and uh, all white parties, and a unique St. Patrick's Day parade with African influence and a Caribbean twist. A unique St. Patrick's Day parade with African influence and a Caribbean twist. During my visits, I learned about an island with a unique heritage and a complex history, as well as one of a kind, as well as a one of a kind festival that combines a legacy of resistance and a good dose of fun. Okay, so then it goes on to talk about um, they have a video here, uh, a unique heritage. Many of the first Europeans who settled on the island of Montserrat in 1632 were Irish Catholics who came as indentured servants, okay? Irish Catholics who came as indentured servants. The Africans who came to Montserrat were enslaved uh, and worked on plantations. The customs and traditions of the two groups blended and the African and Irish influences can be seen as you move across the island. The African and Irish influences can be seen as you move across the island. Montserrat has villages um, with Irish names like Cork Hill, St. Patrick's, and Delvins. Many people have Irish surnames such as uh, O'Donohue, uh, Tuit, Allen, Mead and Sweeney. And you'll even get a shamrock shaped passport stamp when you go through customs at the airport or ferry terminal. The striking semblance of its cliffs and shorelines and, it, and its historical ties to Ireland led to the island being finally called, fondly called the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean. Okay, now here is a picture of some uh, uh, children on the island of African descent, okay? Now, so why does Montserrat celebrate St. Patrick's Day? On Montserrat, St. Patrick's Day became a, nat a national holiday in 1985, but it was not to celebrate St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland. It was not to celebrate Patrick, the saint patron saint of Ireland. The annual festival commemorates the enslaved Africans known as the freedom fighters who lost their lives after their plan, after their planned St. Patrick's Day rebellion set for March 17, 1770, uh, 1768 was discovered. March 17, 1768, after their plan was discovered. The people chose that day for the uprising because it is known to be the day that most enslavers would be drunk and distracted by the holiday. Plans for the rebellion were reportedly overheard by an Irish woman who revealed them to the British. I don't know if her name was Karen, but you know, I don't know her name, but hey. plans for the Rebellion were reportedly overheard, overheard by an Irish woman who revealed them to the British. Tragically, nine of the rebellion's leaders were put to death while another 30 were detained before being exiled off of the island. Although, although the rebellion was unsuccessful, it remained a, a critical moment in the move to abolish slavery in the Caribbean region. This was the first in a series of uprisings 
across the Caribbean that helped end slavery in the region, which ultimately came with the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 across the British Empire. We've talked about that numerous times here on the African History Network show as well. Okay, now here's one picture of this brother in his, uh, looks like 17th century uh, attire. So why is this important? The um, island of Meserets, uh, Amatserets celebration of St. Patrick's Day is twofold. It acknowledges the influence of the Irish on Montserrat and offers an opportunity to reflect on the sacrifices made in the fight for freedom by our African ancestors. The silk cotton tree where a runaway slave, uh, a runaway enslaved man named Cudjo was beheaded and hanged uh, to deter others from fleeing is where the lighting of the flame ceremony takes place annually to mark the festival's opening, okay? The 10-day experience concludes with a heritage feast that features dishes such as the hearty meat, hearty meat stew known as goat water, uh, which is Montserrat's national dish, okay? Well, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian, so I would celebrate with them, but uh, I can't eat any goat stew. One thing that will always stand out to me is seeing the mixture of Ankara prints, Ankara prints, Afro Madras clothes, and people dressed up as abolitionists, such as um, Alajadu, Alajade uh, uh, Equiano, amid leprechaun hats and t shirts. It's a nuanced St. Patrick's Day celebration unlike any other I have ever experienced because it is really about honoring the memory of those freedom fighters. Black people, people of African descent and their role in ending slavery uh, on the island and beyond. Okay, so check out this piece from uh, Essence.com, Essence Magazine, um, March 17th. 2024 yes a caribbean island celebrates saint patrick's day here's why and is dealing with the commemoration of the uh slave rebellion in montserrat that was thwarted and the slave rebellion was planned for march 17th 1768 all right so how y'all doing? How y'all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms and uh, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. At the top of the page, we have our social media platforms. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Uh, and on Instagram, the AHN show on Instagram. Okay, now lastly, there's a uh, article that I want to deal with. This deals with dispelling this myth because over the past few years, there has been um, this misinformation floating around on social media that Patrick was killing killed with something like two hundred thousand uh, twa in Ireland. And that's what all this is really about, which is nonsense. Uh, let's look briefly here. You can read the rest of this. Let's look briefly here at this article from Snopes.com, which dispels all this misinformation floating around on social media. I saw this one video of, a, of this white guy who was uh, spreading this misinformation, cited no sources. Just, just more nonsense. Now, that's not to say that the Twa were not in Ireland, because th these um, the 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 Twa are the short statured Africans. They basically have the oldest DNA on the planet. Um. You may see them referred to as the Khoisan also. It's not saying that 
they weren't there in Ireland. They circumnavigated the globe. But Patrick killing 100,000, tens of thousands, 200,000, I've seen absolutely no evidence to substantiate anything like that. Did St. Patrick wipe out an African pygmy tribe, the first inhabitants of Ireland? A long-standing theory of ancient Irish history describes the genocide of the Twa Pygmies, purportedly the original source of the leprechaun myth. Now, this is from July 29, 2019, Dan McGill, G-U-I-L-L, for Snopes.com. And Snopes, what they do is they investigate internet conspiracy theories and provide you with the evidence and let you know whether the conspiracy theory is true or false, but they provide you with the evidence so you can go research this. So the claim is that St. Patrick led the genocide of a contingent of Twa pygmies from Central Africa who were the original inhabitants of the island. Okay, they said this is false. In the summer of 2019, we received renewed in inquiries uh, from readers about an unusual interpretation of the legacy of St. Patrick, one that claimed the patron saint of Ireland was responsible for the genocide of an African tribe who were purportedly the original inhabitants of that island. Uh, the theory has given rise to many memes and social media posts. Now, notice when you see these memes on social media, they usually don't cite any sources for their information. They usually don't cite any historical sources. It's just more BS. OK. Uh, the theory has given rise to many memes and social media posts that in recent years have been shared widely, especially around March 17th the feast day of St. Patrick. The memes are often accompanied by images that appear to uh, show white men posing with African pygmies or, or African twa. A typical version of the meme claims, quote, the twa pygmies of Ireland, the original inhabitants, the, the source of the leprechaun legend, when you celebrate St. Patrick's Day, that's the celebration of their genocide. This is a celebration of a genocide, okay? But it's not of thousands of twelve. All of it, no. The theory is not backed by any historical evidence, and as a set of factual claims, it can be dismissed. One prominent historian told Snopes it was simply quote complete nonsense. The origins of the Twa theory of Irish prehistory are not entirely clear. Okay, so they go through, they talk about Afrocentrism. However, it appears to be informed by what it seems referred to as Afrocentrism. Afrocentrism, an approach to historical study that emphasizes the role and achievements of African people. And what's the, it, it, it's not, I don't think it's Afrocentrism. I think it's just somebody making stuff up. Afrocentrism is not something in its essence something negative okay this is just some made up nonsense the uh they give some background information the twa or batwa uh are a people indigenous to the great lakes region of central africa they are sometimes referred to as twa pygmies which is calling them pygmies is is a negative term an anthropological term denoting their relatively short stature okay so you can read the rest of this when they talk about um, they talk about the fact that the earliest archaeological evidence of human in, uh, habitation on the island of Ireland dates to between 10,640 BC or around that time. And then they go on to say no evidence exists to show the Twa Pygmies settled the island at any point in history beyond which it uh, makes little sense to imagine. Uh, but they say that um, the Twa had no knowledge to construct and sail ships thousands of miles northwest. I disagree. We understand that the Twa circumnavigated the globe, number one. Number two, when you look at the discovery that came out in 2012, I think it's 2012, 
and there's an article uh, dealing with the Greek island of Crete and how on the Greek island of Crete, stone tools were found that date back uh, 130,000 years ago. And the archaeologists are saying that people had to have sailed there. And the only people on the face of the earth 130,000 years ago were African people. So then you realize that, okay, it's not far fetched for the uh, for the Twa to be set to have been sailing. Uh, let's go to this here. Let me pull this up. This deals with. Uh, so we, we deal with this. Uh, discovery because there are numerous archaeological discoveries that we uh, look at in uh, the online class that I teach on Saturdays, ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And I first heard Dr. David M. Hotep talk about this, uh, this discovery. He was the first one I heard talk about this discovery. It was in an interview he did back in 2010 on WKRP in Cincinnati Channel, uh, Channel 5. So the name of this article is on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. Uh, this is from February 15, 2010. Yeah, February 15, 2010, New York Times. And what the article says is that stone tools found, and here's what the article looked like. Um, this is the actual article here from New York Times. But here's what it said. Stone tools found on the Greek, isle, Greek island of Crete, C-R-E-T-E, -E, over two summers, archaeologists say, are at least 130,000 years old, at least 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in stone tool archaeology say. Now, you've heard me say before, here on the African History Network show and in my classes, the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. And when these archaeological discoveries come out, they keep having to push the timelines back. They keep having to back that thing up, okay? Like, like the song by Juvenile, 1999, okay? Cash Money Records is taking over for the 99 and 2000. Everybody knows the song. When the, the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. And there's numerous archaeological discoveries I've looked at. And, and the scientists, the archaeologists, the paleontologists, the anthropologists, they say, this is causing us to rethink everything they're realizing that all of this is much older than they thought, and they keep having to push the timelines back. Now, previous artifacts, previous artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus, a few other Greek islands, and possibly, possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. They're saying that, wait a second, this causes us to push uh mediterranean voyaging the timeline for that back more than a hundred thousand years ago all right so more than two thousand stone artifacts including hand axes were collected on the southwestern shore of crete that's over the course of two summers so this is more than one or two stone tools being found they found over two thousand stone tools and artifacts okay stone artifacts they they found more than 2000 stone artifacts 
including hand axes. All right, now, okay, so check uh, check that article out. And then if we look uh, very quickly here at who are the Khoisan, right? Who are the Khoisan, the short-statured Africans? The ancestors to thy new and the twa. Um, Khoisan right here. Because we know that the Khoisan were here in the land that we call the United States of America. Going back at least 51,700 years ago. And this was this is what Dr. David M. Hotep deals with in the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. Okay, this book here. Dr. Dem Hotel was a friend of mine. We, I interviewed him 13 times on African History Network show. We know he passed away in uh, late 2023. I attended his funeral online. Uh, so he's an ancestor now. But this is his first book. His second book, uh, The First Americans Were Africans, Revised and Expanded. Okay, it's his second book and it has even more information. But page 14 of his book, he deals with this discovery made by Dr. Albert Goodyear who's an archaeologist, archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. They, uh, uh, this was at a campsite in Allendale County, South Carolina. They found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in the Americas dating back at least 51,700 years ago. Okay, They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, skull, skeleton, structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence. His book is backed up by 713 footnotes, as well as seven peer-reviewed articles. This is Dr. Albert Goodyear here. Uh, there's an article from sciencedaily.com called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. This article is 20 years old. It's from November 18, 2004. You can go read that. It talks about the discovery. This piece right here talks about the Khoisan. An October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. Their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago or at least 100,000 years ago. It could be older than that. The Khoisan, formerly called by the, deris, by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had, had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. So here are a couple of Khoisan sisters right here. Okay, now the Khoisan live mainly in southern Africa in territories spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, um, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers known as the Sans people, S-A-N-S, and keepers of the livestock known as the Khoi Khoi people. So Sarah Bartman, uh, Sarah Sartagy Bartman, who was also known as Hottentot Venus, who was paraded throughout Europe in the early 1800s and freak shows and she had large buttocks and large breasts she was uh khoisan the khoisan languages include the distinctive clicks click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors there's a good article from atlantablackstar.com called five groups that prove the first humans were black you can check that out okay now lastly african liberation day african liberation day so Oftentimes, I get people uh, asking about African Liberation Day, and I want to go to, let's go to this, uh, yeah, timeanddate.com. Let's go to this article here quickly and look at this, because I've been to numerous African Liberation Day celebrations here in the Detroit, uh, in, uh, in Detroit, and it falls on May 25th. They may hold this celebration on the weekend, say if May 25th falls during the week. They may hold it on the weekend. Um, African Liber So this comes from timeanddate.com, the other sources you could look at. This is one of the first articles that, that I have uh, bookmarked. Uh, African Liberation Day 2024. May 25th 
is African Liberation Day. On this day, many African countries celebrate the hard fought achievement of their freedom from European colonial powers, from European colonial powers. Uh, African Liberation Day is celebrated by many African communities around the world. It is a permanent mass institution in the worldwide, worldwide Pan-African movement. The day is observed in countries such as Ghana, Kenya, Spain, Tanzania, the United Kingdom, and the United States, and the United States. Events include formal gatherings with panel discussions, street marches, speeches by political social leaders, special university university lectures, uh, cultural entertainment, poetry, speakers, etc. In the United States, the day is commemorated in in form of is commemorated in form of symposiums where people are invited to participate in political and social issues relevant to U.S. African communities. OK, although widely observed on a global scale by various African communities, African Liberation Day is not a federal holiday in many countries, including Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom and the United States. May 25th is a public holiday in Ghana. Some background historical information. African African Freedom Day was founded during the first conference of independent um, African uh, states, which attracted African leaders and political activists from various African countries in Ghana on April 15th, April 15th, 1958. Government representatives from eight independent African states attended the conference, which was the first Pan-African conference in the continent. The purpose of the day was to annually mark the liberation movement's uh, progress and to symbolize the determination of the people of Africa to free themselves from foreign domination and exploitation. Between 1958 and 1963, the nation class struggle grew bigger in Africa and around the world. During the period, during this period, 17 countries in Africa won their independence and 60 in 1960 was proclaimed the year of Africa. Okay. During this period, 17 countries in Africa won their independence and the year 1960 was proclaimed the year of Africa. On May 25th, 1963 31 african leaders convened a summit meeting to uh, a summit meeting to found the organization of african unity the oau the organization of african unity they renamed african freedom day as african liberation day and changed its date to may 25th the founding date of the Organization of African Unity is also referred to as Africa Day. African Liberation has African Liberation Day has helped to uh, raise political awareness in African communities across the world. It has also been a source of information about the struggles for liberation and development. Okay, uh, when we look at symbols. Uh, many organizations use an outline of the map of Africa or the shape of Africa as a feature to symbolize the day. Pan-African colors, which are widely used for the day, come in different sets of three colors. The green, gold, and red colors used in the, in the flag of Ghana and the red, black, and green colors adopted by the American-based Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community League, African Communities League, better known as the UNIA, which started in Jamaica in 1914. And then uh, when Marcus Garvey uh, comes to the U.S. in 1916, he starts setting up chapters of the UNIA here. All right. So uh, check uh, check that out at timeanddate.com, uh, African Liberation Day, that oracle. And... I think I got through everything I wanted to get through. Um, let me double check my notes here. Hopefully you all learned a lot today. It's here longer than I had anticipated being here, but we got through the information.
This is a deep, deep history. And uh, you're not going to find a lot of presentations like this. If you like this type of information, be sure to uh, register for the online history classes that I teach on Saturdays uh, at our online school. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And right at the top of the page, we have the information. We teach the classes Saturdays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Kemet's one of the original names for Egypt. Um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Just click right here, register here. And we have the lesson plan for the introductory session, uh, which was the first session. And then all 10 uh, sessions we have of the lesson plans here so you can uh, download that you can see the type of information that we cover uh classes on sale uh 80 we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded so you don't have to be in present in class you can go back and watch this anytime a year from now two years from now you can go back and watch the entire course you don't lose access to it okay um and i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips Actually, let me show you this right here. When we go through, it gives you a quick description here when we look at the lesson plans. So there are 80, uh, there's um, a PowerPoint presentation that consists of over 200 slides that I put together. I developed this course. I've been teaching this class on and off since 2017. So the class has um, evolved immensely from when I first taught it. There's 80 to 100 articles that we reference in the class. There's 15 books that we use as reference. You don't have to, you don't have to purchase any of, these, any of these books to follow along in class. I'll show you uh, excerpts of the book on the screen. There's also video clips of interviews I've done with our uh, historians throughout the years, like Professor Jane Small, Professor Kabahaya Wafta Kamene, uh, Anthony Browder, Renoko Rashidi, and more. So we look at some excerpts of interviews that I've done uh, as well, okay? So it's a fantastic class. The content is PG-13. You could use this with your children. Uh, next class is Saturday, uh, March 23rd, Saturday, March 30th, uh, Saturday, April 6th, April 13th, and April 20th. We may do um, a, an additional session after that, okay? And you can also uh, support us at the African History Network. Like I said, we're celebrating our, our 14th year anniversary of me broadcasting the african history network show which first started uh march 10th 2010 on the harambe radio network then we went to broadcasting live on blog talk radio i've done the empowerment radio network uh nationally syndicated radio uh we did 9 10 a.m super wfdf for seven years also and now we're still on social media okay so we're in all different uh uh all different platforms I've done. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App is our official Cash App account. When you go to it, it says Michael, and it'll probably show my picture there. These other ones and, and a few others like it are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. They've been stealing money from us. You can click right here on our link. It takes you to our QR code. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, ours is our only Cash App account. And then uh, also PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. All right. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, um, you can email me right through the website. Right at the top where it says contact uh, the African History Network uh, right here. You can email me right through the website. And um, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, either in person or um, virtual or if you want uh, if you want to interview me. OK. We also have in a digital download format my 15, uh, uh, a, a bundle pack of 15 of my lectures in digital download format. This is um, African History Awakens the African Mind from Mental Death. African History Awakens the African Mind from Mental Death. You get 15 of my lectures in digital download format. If you want it in DVD format, it's $100. This is on sale, $75. You get three of my, you actually get 16 lectures because you get the the last one that I did with uh, uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever from November 2022, okay? You get that as well, but you get some of my lectures done with Black Panther. 
uh, the Black Panther movies, uh, Malcolm X, Dr. King, uh, Six Principles of Political Self-Defense, How Laws and Policies Impact the Economic Conditions of African Americans, uh, 13 Forms of Wealth, Keys to uh, Entrepreneurship and Economic Empowerment, because I taught entrepreneurship for seven years. Ancient Kemet, the Winter Solstice, and, Winter Solstice and the History of Christmas. The First Americans were Africans documented evidence. It's a double lecture I did uh, here in Detroit with Dr. David M. Hotep a few years ago. Uh, so you get that one. Also, uh, Redistributing the Pain, how African Americans fought back with economic uh, boycotts. That's a four hour lecture that I did showing historical examples of us using different types of economic withdrawal strategies to fight back against white supremacy. The light of ancient Egypt awakens the African mind to economic empowerment. Um, ancient Africans in America before Native Americans, Columbus or slavery, great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. That's a four hour presentation right there. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. Uh, African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, the high elections have consequences. That was a deep presentation that I did. And uh, you get the uh, last one that I did on Black Panther. So we have that uh, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. When you scroll down the website, it has our different uh, uh, DVD lectures and some in uh, digital download format. So you scroll down, it has a lot of my lectures here. Uh, scroll down. Uh, right in here. Yep. Has a uh, DVD lectures, digital download uh, format also. All right. Look, that's going to do it for us. Thanks for tuning in to this broadcast of the African History Network show. I know we covered a lot of information. This is a, a deep history dealing with uh, St. Patrick's Day, dealing with the Druids, dealing with African history, all of that. So hopefully you learned a lot. Uh, follow us on our social media platforms. Uh, support the African History Network. Uh, remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. We're here. Uh, we broadcast Sundays, uh, normally 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the African History Network show, and wherever you, you get your audio podcast from, search for the African History Network show because we're on iHeartRadio, Blog Talk, uh, TuneIn, CastBox, Stitcher, FM Players. So we're on like nine different audio podcast platforms. All right, talk to you next time. Peace.